Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second seminar dedicated to Mohale Mashiho's work. And uh, as you all know, Mohale is our author in residence this year. And this year is our third edition of Ariel, which means Auteur en Residence Internationale en Lorraine, a project which was uh, initiated by Barbara Schmidt, Céline Sabiron, and uh, Amy Pelletier. This year, we could welcome our author in residence, thanks to our sponsors, uh, Université de Lorraine, UIT Charlemagne, UFR AEL Nancy, IDEA, and Metropole du Grand Nancy. Before I give the floor to, uh, to Cédric Courtois, our chairperson today, to present this seminar, I'd like to thank my colleagues who have helped with the organization, Céline, Marilyn, Claire, Nathalie, Estelle, and our research assistants who have been working very hard um, to advertise these events, Lisa, Pauline, Delphine, Eras, and Elise. They're all master's degree students. This series of five seminars have been organized for our research lab, IDEA, and our master's degree students. And I hope there are many of you today here to follow this seminar. Uh, if you have questions or comments, do not hesitate to write them down under the YouTube video. And our guests today will be answering them or reacting to them. So I would like to thank our guests tonight, Cathy Bira and Richard Samin, who will be introduced by Lisa, my research assistant. And unfortunately, Richard could not be here with us today because of technical problems, but uh, we found a solution and you'll be able to listen to him. And of course, you'll be able to read his paper later as it will be published in our Ariel volume uh, dedicated to Mohale. So now, uh, Cédric, would you like to take over and present uh, today's seminar? Thank you. Well, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or depending where you're situated right now, very good morning or evening to you. Well, I'm Cédric Courtois, Associate Professor at the University of Lille here in France, and I will be the chair of this uh, panel today. I'm very honoured to be here with you, and I do hope that you'll be enjoying this one hour and a half session with us. Here is how we have planned uh, things. There will be two 30-minute uh, papers, each of them followed by a 15-minute Q&A session. I deeply encourage uh, all of you, whether you be students, academics, and or Mohale Mashiro uh, fans or others, uh, to engage with what you will hear. Uh, I'd like to insist on the importance for students as well to really engage with what they will hear. And uh, it's a great opportunity, of course, for them to ask for clarifications, for instance, or to react uh, and simply uh, uh, give their opinions. Feel free uh, to do so. Um, now, this uh, particular session today is quite different from the one that took place a week ago. Uh, last week, Veronique, Veronique uh, Tadjo talked about children's literature, uh, both from uh, South African and West African perspectives, while Julie Chancel gave a paper focusing on South African comics with reference to Mohale Mashiro's own experience as regards this particular genre. Talking about literary genres uh, uh, will partly be uh, one of the main points today. Contrary to last week's uh, speakers, today's speakers, uh, Cathy Vira and Richard Samin, who will be introduced later by Lisa, decided to focus on Mashiro's uh, fictional works. Cathy Vira will deal uh, with Mashiro's 2018 short story collection, Intruders, while Richard Samin, who, uh, as my colleague said, for technical reasons, can't be among us today, but he was kind enough to record uh, his paper for us. Well, he, uh, he will address uh, Mashiro's uh, first fictional work, a novel entitled The Yearning, written uh, in 2016. Well, with no further ado, the first paper by Cathy Vira is entitled Through the Lens of Speculative Fiction, Seeing South Africa Through the Short Story, Mohale Mashiro's Intruders. I'll let Lisa introduce uh, Cathy. And once again, to all of you, do not hesitate uh, to ask questions. I'll ask them at the end of Cathy's paper. Enjoy. Lisa. Cathy Pira is an emeritus professor of English at the University of Lorraine. She has published numerous articles on American, African-American and Afro-Caribbean writers with particular emphasis, as far as the Caribbean is concerned, on the works of Carol Phillips, Fred Dagiar, Sam Selvin and David Dabaiden. She is especially interested in questions relating to voice and orality. She edited a special edition of Commonwealth Essays and Studies devoted to Carol Phillips in 2017. 
Among our recent publications are Making Sense of Memory in the Writings of the Caribbean Diaspora, Sam Selvan's London Calypso, which appeared in the Journal of Postcolonial Writings in 2019, and Le Point d'Atrication, Écriture, Oralité, Langue Écrit et Langue Parlée, dans la littérature de la Caraïbe anglophone, l'exemple de Sam Selvan, published in Pratique, Oralité, Littératie, in 2020. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're just waiting for the for the slides. Mohali Mashigo's collection of short stories, Intruders opens with an author's note introduced by a phonetic representation of the word intruders, intruders. This phonetic spelling suggests that the reader, if he is not to be seen as an intruder himself, must accept to pronounce the word as it appears on the page, and thus to relinquish that part of himself which might resist inclusion in a world in which words are not pronounced exactly as he is used. The collection includes an author's note, a brief introduction in which the notion of speculative fiction is discussed, and three sections entitled The Good, The Bad, and The Colorful, each of which includes four stories. The collection ends with a remark by Ethel Barrymore, that's all there is, there isn't any more, and a section of acknowledgments. Each section begins with a drawing, and here you can see uh, the three drawings that begin the sections, uh, each one of them representing a character from one of the stories. But I think the drawings are important because the stories definitely have a visual aspect. In order to be as concise as possible, while at the same time trying to capture the essence of what Mashigo is doing, is attempting to do in this collection of stories, I'm going to discuss the stories in their relation to Mashigo's use of the short story as a form and to the notion of speculative fiction. The underlying question in my reading of the stories is, what does the use of a speculative lens add to the imagining of a future that is free of white supremacy? Mohali Mashigo begins her introduction to the stories with Mark Derry's definition of Afrofuturism, which he describes as an African-American signification that approaches, <coughs> appropriates images of technology and a prosthetically enhanced future. You have two other definitions here of Afrofuturism. Afrofuturism is a, an art form practice and methodology that allows black people to see themselves in the future despite a distressing past and present. This is a definition given by Greg Tate, who is a cultural critic. A number of different terms are used to designate forms of fiction that imagine alternative futures speculative fiction, science fiction, dystopian, utopian fiction, fantasy, and there is some overlapping in all of these terms. The term speculative fiction is attributed to the science fiction writer Robert Heinlein, and the term has since come to be used to collectively describe works in the genres of science fiction, fantasy, and horror. One finds traces of these different aspects of speculative fiction in intruders. Mashigo prefers the term speculative fiction to the notion of Afrofuturism, which she says is not for Africans living in Africa. She is concerned with imagining futures or reimagining a fantasy present. And the term speculative places the emphasis on imagination as a way of seeing. The use of the term speculative from the Latin specere to see suggests that speculation involves forms of sight, insight, hindsight, foresight, oversight, all of which can be found in intruders. 
Before looking at the forms of speculation involved in intruders, I think it is important to consider the role played by the short story, <clears throat> as I believe that it is the combination of a speculative point of view with the brevity of the form that gives a particular impact to these stories. The brevity of the short story contributes, contributes to its intensity and its impact on the reader. This aspect of the form has been much discussed since Edgar Allan Poe's well-known remarks about reading a story in one sitting. Some critics see in this combination of brevity and intensity a relationship with the lyric poem. In their introduction to the study of the short story, story Liliane Louvel and Claudine Verlet talk about what they call the hybridity of the genre. Elizabeth Bowen stated that the short story should have the valid central emotion and inner spontaneity of the lyric. V.S. Pritchett considers that the short story begins as a poetic insight and is a way of seeing through a situation. One of the effects or the corollaries of this imagined proximity between the short story and the lyric is a perception of the ways in which the economy of the form produces a juxtaposition of the ordinary and the extraordinary, the mundane and the fantastic. This proximity we will see is at the heart of what Mohali Mashigo is doing with her stories in Intruders. One other important aspect of the hybridity of the short story is its relation to other forms of narrative, in particular the fairy tale and the folk tale. Mashigo refers to the importance of the folk tale and calls upon the form explicitly in the final story, Natisi. The fairy tale is also in the background through the use of motifs like that of the orphan or abandoned child and the reference to hidden or forbidden spaces, as in the story B and B in Bloom. If we return to the idea that the short story involves a juxtaposition of the ordinary and the extraordinary, we can say that it is the speculative dimension that introduces elements of the extraordinary in Mashigo's representation of South Africa. Manuka is the story of a woman growing tentacles who kills her lover. When I realized that the tentacles came from beneath my kanga, I looked at Dumiso, foaming at the mouth and choking on blood, only his eyes were moving. Ghost Strain N revolves around a young man who carries his friend Stephen, who has become a ghost, a living dead thing, around in a coffin in the backs of various stolen cars. Little vultures suggest the idea of tampering with genetics. I quote, we named baby A after the first man in creation. Hubris, I know. These fantastic or speculative elements are introduced into a narrative reality that constitutes the ordinary or mundane. Mashigo's purpose is to disturb what could be described as the normal relation between events and the exp explanation of them that could be given, without, however, venturing deeply into what could be called alternative realities. In speculative fiction, there are different levels of technicity, different degrees of engagement with the form. From this point of view, the brevity of the short story is crucial. In longer forms of fiction, the creation of alternative worlds either becomes an object in itself or tends toward political or cultural allegory. By keeping her stories short, Mashigo prefers their suggestive and hence speculative potential. To return to the remark made by V.S. Pritchett, the author's insight can be seen as the key to her use of foresight. What then exactly is the connection between the speculative and the ordinary and intruders? 
The very motif of the intruder offers an important clue to this relation. The characters are seen as intruders in different ways. The inseparable girls in B&B and &B in Bloom are orphans, as are the sisters Camo and Bonolo in Untitled 1, 2, and 3. And I quote, Having been intruders for most of their lives, the girls knew instinctively which places adults didn't want them to enter. Nolwazi Botha, the woman who murdered her husband in On the Run, is also an adopted child. However, if the motif of the orphan gives a specific and literal meaning to the notion of intrusion, in a social sense, the idea underlies all of the stories, becoming a metaphor for the forms of exclusion involved. It constitutes a crucial link between the social background and the event which constitutes the narrative nucleus of each story. Ghost Train N is concerned with South Africa's treatment of young drug addicts, B&B and &B in Bloom with racism, violence against women, and the invisibility of the many abused people who built South Africa. On the Run evokes the violence against blacks under apartheid. The High Heel Killer is concerned more specifically with violence against women. However, if the idea of the intruder can be seen as a way of focalizing and personifying the forms of exclusion that characterize life in South Africa, it is not simply an allegory of the ills affecting the country. There is no one-to-one -one relationship to be established between a character or an event and the social and political context of South Africa. Such an approach would simply shut down the stories rather than opening, up, opening them up to the imagination, to the speculative. In order to understand how Mashigo uses the speculative lens to imagine futures, I'm going to look at two aspects of the stories that contributing to opening what I might call an imaginative window offering a different or renewed perception of the world represented in the stories. The first aspect is human relationships, which play an essential role in bringing the social problems of South Africa into sharp focus. The second element is the relation between past and future. One element that seems constant in the stories is a focus on a relationship between two people, whether it be a relationship between a mother and daughter, grandmother and her granddaughter, between two sisters or twins, or between friends. The speculative elements bring this relationship into focus in ways that enlarge it suggesting the possibility of human relations functioning as a counter space, a fortress against personalization that characterizes the surrounding society. A good example of this can be found in the three stories involving Camo and her sister Bonolo. The speculative setting of Untitled One is created by the anticipation of a cataclysmic event. The sun was definitely still in the sky, but angry clouds that looked like a frustrated artist splashes of paint blocked it. People stood in the streets looking at the sky with curiosity, which grew into panic when it became apparent that the experts didn't have any answers. Bonolo's perception of the events in the story is guided by the reactions of her sister, who is described as mature for her years, although she is younger than Bonolo. By the end of the story, it becomes clear that Camo has decided that her sister should be the one to board a spaceship and leave the Earth. Against the background of the unbelievable events, the contrast between the different characters in the story stands out in bold relief. A few concise remarks suffice to reveal what is at stake in the relations between them. 
the contrast between the sisters, the strong-willed Camo and the doubting Bonolo, is expressed through their bodies. Bonolo closed her eyes and imagined she could still see Camo running back to the car, back straight, shoulders back, and neck resolute. She never looked back. This contrasts with the description of Bonolo being strapped into the spaceship. She felt she was floating as the blur in her egg-shaped compartment. Her arms, legs, and torso were strapped in. This functioning in counterpoint becomes clearer if one looks at another story, Ghost Strain N. In this story, the pivotal relationship concerns a young man named Coquetso, who works in a funeral home, and his friend Stephen, who becomes one of the ghosts the young people who have fallen into despair. You would think that the nation would have sat up when its young people lost their ability to stand up straight or speak. Nothing happened as these ghosts were overtaking corners of the townships. Saliva dripped from their mouths as their muscles relaxed, eyes half shut, some bent over in the kind of ecstasy and agony oblivion brings. Like Camo in Untitled One, Coquetso sets out to save his friend. Was Stephen far gone that some other group of frightened, angry people would see fit to kill him rather than let him eat the hearts of people? He didn't come to any satisfactory conclusion, but he knew what had to be done and packed a bag, filled it in a hurry with knives, a knob carry, his mother's church shawl, toilet paper, and other things he thought would be important, and all the canned food he could find. The reader's reaction to the crisis developing around the outbreak, scientists were calling it a virus is channeled through the relationship between Coquetso and Stephen, which serves as a lens through which the sensual and emotional life of the community becomes perceptible. The narrator says in speaking of Coquetso, how could he possibly describe anything when the world around him had lost its color? Stephen was the color ever since they were kids, Coquetso drew the lines and saw the bigger picture, but Stephen always added the color and the purpose. This is where the poetic insight evoked by Pritchett becomes a vehicle for seeing through a situation. The situation in this case involves Coquetso driving his friend around in a coffin in the backs of various stolen cars. As in, as in Untitled One, there is an apocalyptic atmosphere. Coquetso was now on the run with his ghost friend. He was not ready to give up on Stephen. They avoided strangers, the army, and houses that could be seen from the road. The apocalyptic dimension of the narrative. Over time, houses were reverting back to nature. Those who once lived in them could never have imagined their homes covered by grass and vines. Pavements were one-third concrete and two-thirds what was being suppressed beneath it. This is balanced with an emphasis on Coquetso's subjectivity, which keeps the story from being monopolized with horror. Another story entitled Little Vultures takes impersonal relations to a more abstract level and introduces as well the question of what it means to be human, which is a vital question in Mashigo's fiction. The speculation in this story involves tampering with the principle of life itself. The narrator says, before the animals, it was the babies. My research turned baby A into a reality. Two females made a baby, and it was an abomination, according to those who were spokespeople for the gods. The relationship in this story involves three women. The narrator, who is a genomicist, 
Ingrid, a remarkable pianist with a strange desire to alter her face continually, and Violet, also a geneticist and one of the narrator's former classmates. In this case, the relationship between the women is conflictual. The question of tampering with nature serves as a mirror reflecting the forms of frustration experienced by the women. The farm they share becomes a microcosm of the problems faced by women, professional recognition, aging, motherhood. The story acquires dramatic intensity through the idea that the experimentation carried out by Violet involves crossing a line. The narrator possesses a capacity to hear people's thoughts that gives this notion of crossing a line a self-reflexive dimension. The story Little Vultures offers an occasion to consider the second aspect of Mashigo's imagining of the future, the question of hindsight. In other words, the relation between future and past. As in much African-American fiction, and I think particularly of Toni Morrison's Beloved, uh, there is a sense in these African stories that a failure to understand the past will compromise the future. Tampering with the future is a way of reimagining the past. In Little Vultures, the narrator's experimentation with the quaha, an extinct subspecies of the zero, offers insight on South Africa's past. The narrator says, I guess you could say my work is conservation, conservation of extinct animals. The fate of the quaha, which became extinct in 1878, is linked to the history of South Africa it was, as it was hunted by early Dutch settlers and later by Afrikaners. It competed with domesticated animals for forage after the Dutch settlement of the region. Thus, in an oblique way, the narrator's experimentation with the quaha evokes questions of rivalry, territory, and exclusion in relation to human populations in South Africa. The idea of genetic tampering also suggests darker ideas of race and, eugenic, and eugenics. The death threats received by the narrator reactualize these questions in the present of the narration. The short story itself begins this, becomes the site of an experimentation involving the reimagining of the past in terms of an alternative future. One could say that the intrusion of the future in these stories is a response to certain forms of exclusion that characterize the past. Exclusion, inclusion, intrusion, these ideas are closely related. Mashigo's stories reactivate the past by representing a character's confrontation with a situation of crisis. The past is therefore not simply a static representation consigned to individual or collective memory. It is reactivated in a narrative confrontation with the necessity of imagining the future. The story Untitled 2, which picks up the story of Bonolo being sent into space by her sister Camo, presents the future in terms that reflect the standard cliches of science fiction involving space travel and the search for new planets. What interests Mashigo is not the technology of space travel, but the fundamental questions that underline our imagining of space travel as a response to the disasters provoked on Earth. In Untitled One, an unidentified voice had said, we are used to disasters here in South Africa, just look at our government. As she is floating through space in Untitled Two, Bonolo thinks to herself, maybe I'm, when I am out there, I will find a different set of people with a sense of history and irony because this place is suffocating me. That Mashigo would associate the words irony and history is significant in itself. For anyone with a real sense of history will be sensitive to the ironies that underlie all history. 
What she presents in her stories is not a collection of facts that could be called history, but a series of situations which, if properly understood, can be seen as condensations of history, as metaphors for the monsters spawned by the history of South Africa. The end of the story raises the vital question of the possibility of a future, of what one will find on a new planet. When Bonolo leaves the spaceship, she says, I fell on my knees, still keeping my hands in the air. How is this possible? Standing around me all with their hands up is me. Not really me, but there are six people or things standing around with the same face as me. They are different heights and sizes, but all wearing the same me mask. I drop my hands to my sides and they drop theirs as well. Oh God. There are several possible interpretations of this outcome. It could suggest, and this is a staple of speculative fiction, that travel to outer space will only reveal the repetition of what already exists, that Bonolo will be confronted with a mirror image of herself. It could also imply, and this is in keeping with patterns found in other stories, that a transformation is possible offering new possibilities within the same basic framework of identity. Ultimately, what is at stake in Mashigo's use of speculative fiction is the very possibility of seeing or imagining a future for Africans. Foresight, if it is not guided by insight and hindsight, may imply a desire for control the temptation to colonize the future as a replica of the past. In an article entitled Postcolonial Futures, Climate, Race, and the Yet to Come, Andrew Baldwin summarizes the dilemma facing postcolonial approaches to the challenges of the future. The yet to come can be promissory. It is precisely recognition of an open, malleable future that fuels the ethics and politics of invention now so prevalent across the social sciences and humanities. But more often than not, and this is Derrida's point, the yet to come is monstrous, excessive, and unknowable. And he goes on to say, I wish to suggest that a revitalized post-colonial theory would do well to address itself to the ways in which the yet to come is itself colonized, but also to the ways in which the subaltern becomes central to its colonization. Master Go's stories speculate about the conditions necessary for imagining the future. The wings that the narrator grows in the high heel killer can be seen as the concrete form of her newly acquired capacity to act in her own defense. As she says at the end of the story, I birthed myself. It was bloody and, pain and painful, but I'm standing on the roof of a city as something new. Up here, nobody can tell me what I deserve, who I should be, or how I should be. And I dare those down below to open their mouths and tell another tired, underpaid woman that she deserves the cruelty of the city. I'm the enemy of cruelty, and they'll have to deal with me. Well, thank you very much, Katie, for this very uh, thought-provoking uh, paper uh, addressing the issues of uh, genre, particularly the, the short story, of course, here and um, speculative uh, fiction. I do uh, want to, uh, because I, I can't see any question for the moment uh, from um, our uh, YouTube viewers, but I have a question to bounce back on one of your last ideas about uh, post-colonialism and, uh, and, and this particular aspect. Um, 
I'm particularly interested in um, the first text in uh, Intruders, which I uh, would consider myself, you, you'll tell me whether you uh, agree with me or not, uh, this text entitled Afro Afrofuturism, Ayashi Izama Teki, mm -hmm. uh, which I would consider um, uh, as a, a, some sort of a literary manifesto uh, in order to better understand maybe what comes uh, uh, next. Uh, and in this particular uh, text, she says, uh, Mashiro explains, I quote, I'm also interested in who we are now, no matter how unremarkable we seem under the lens of speculative fiction. This is partly uh, some of, of uh, well, part of your title. And her focus here seems to be on seemingly uh, unremarkable people. And later in the same essay, she also explains that as a, as a black person in South Africa, she has never really suffered from a lack of representation, be it on TV or others, but she still admits that in South Africa, her, I quote, culture, language and presence were considered a nuisance. And from that perspective, how post-colonial or maybe decolonial do you think her collection of short story could be uh, considered? Uh, do you think that uh, decoloniality could have uh, uh, something to do with, uh, with this uh, uh, collection of short stories. Right. Well, she's definitely concerned with the visibility or invisibility of people uh, that she says, you know, we were simply considered uh, to be a nuisance. Uh, so I think, and I think she says something interesting in, in the story Ghost Train N. There's uh, a remark that I like a lot at the beginning of the story, the, na the narrator says, you see a major event is really just a string of small overlooked events holding hands. So the idea, the whole idea of what is visible, what is perceptible, and the perspective for, from which you see this. And she is looking at South Africans from the perspective of someone living in South Africa. So for her, because we talked together uh, in an interview about Afrofuturism. And of course, Afrofuturism, she, she specifically says that she doesn't really see herself in terms of Afrofuturism mm -hmm. because Afrofuturism is the film Black Panther. So, you know, where do you really see Africans in that? Mm -hmm. So her idea of speculative fiction is basically seeing what there is to see in South Africa. Mm. And uh, seeing what is remarkable about things that seem unremarkable, like boys surfing on trains, something mm. she refers to also in Ghost Train N. So I think this is why uh, the emphasis on human relationships is important also, because it's basically a question of the perspective from which you're looking at things and what it is that makes people remarkable or unremarkable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have a, a, a question um, um, from one of our viewers. Uh, how do you articulate speculative fiction, Afrofuturism and magical realism? Well, Afrofuturism, if you look at, uh, if you look, look at the definition of it uh, that Derry gives, he, um, he is going to insist, um, wait a minute, if I find this again, he, he's going to insist on the idea of technology, for instance. Um, in, uh, in the interview, there's a long interview that she took uh, that she took this remark uh, about speculative friction from this uh, essay called Black to the Future, which is, of course, a joke, Black, Back to the Future. Uh, this is an interview with Sam Delaney, Greg Tate, and Tr Tricia Rose, in which they talk a lot about the question of technology. I think that Afrofuturism uh, tends to uh, tends to emphasize this sort of technical vision of the future. Now, uh, as far as as far as speculative fiction is concerned, I think this is speculative fiction is perhaps the broadest term that is used. It's a term that can be used for any kind of fiction. 
that is concerned with uh, trying to see, to, to imagine the future. And as I mentioned, it's like apparently Robert Heinlein, uh, the American uh, science fiction writer uh, who was the source of this particular term, speculative fiction. Uh, but now, as far as magic realism is concerned, um, this is something... Uh, this is something that maybe we should also ask uh, Mahari Mashigo about. Uh, I, I, I don't really feel that she's concerned here with, with magic realism. Magic, of course, the, there's the whole problem of how you categorize fiction. Uh, when you think of magic realism, you think of Alejo Carpentier or you think of uh, Ben Okri in Africa. Uh, it, it seems to me that she's not really using this kind of idea of two, two levels of reality, one of which can be seen as magic and the other real, uh, mm. nor is she trying to use a purely psychological perspective. Uh, but I think, I think the, the interest really of speculative fiction for her is doing something that in a way sort of jolts you or shocks you. But uh, I don't, I don't think if you add if you add the magical realism aspect, then you sort of put it back into a traditional African context, which is present in, in Mashigo's fiction, uh, particularly in terms of storytelling. But I don't think that she's really uh, concerned with magic realism here. She's, she's Because basically when I talk about or she talks about seeing things through the lens of speculative fiction. She's using, in a sense, the cliches of science fiction and speculative fiction, but not taking them very far. Because as I said at the beginning of my paper, when you go too far into speculation, it tends to become allegory or ideology. And I think this is really not what she's interested in. She's interested in opening up perspectives. Okay, thank you. I have a, a, another question. You mentioned the division of the collection into three sections, the good, the bad, the colorful. Is there a thematic or other uh, unity in each section which justifies this division? And is there some form of evolution throughout the collection which justifies the order in which the short stories appear? Do you need uh, me to repeat or no? No, is that okay? Yeah. That's an interesting question. Um, I, I wondered about uh, I wondered about the, uh, the the good, the bad. Um, I think particularly uh, the section that is titled The Bad, you have, for instance, the high heel killer. Uh, in other words, the woman who uh, kills someone who has been, has been harassing her. And this picture, uh, the picture at the beginning of uh, the section called The Bad, uh, I think this picture refers to uh, a story that it, I did not discuss specifically, a story on the run called On the Run, uh, in which a woman kills her husband in a very violent way. And this is the woman, I think, uh, who kills her husband. You recognize her by the way she describes her hair. So the section uh, called The Bad, you have an, uh, several women who do violent things and could be seen as the bad uh, from a social point of view. Uh, the section in the section called the colorful, uh, you have the high heel killer who is going to uh, transform. Uh, this is the colored picture that you have on the cover of the, the collection. And uh, who I think through her gesture of fighting back and killing someone with a high heel, uh, which is rather humorous in a way, and there is a certain amount of humor in these stories, is going to reach a kind of affirmation uh, which, uh, which gives her, perhaps gives her more color. Now, as to whether there is a progression 
what about the arrangement of the stories in the collection? I haven't really given that any thought specifically. I didn't really see uh, any particular progression, except, of course, in the stories Untitled 1, 2, and 3, uh, that involve uh, the same characters. Perhaps what is significant also is the fact that the final story, uh, Natisi, uh, and I excuse, I, I may not be pronouncing that right, but uh, in this story, there is a return to the notion of storytelling uh, in the sense of the folk tale. So the fact that this is the final story might be significant since it perhaps goes back to the importance of oral storytelling, because as I also mentioned, there is a distinct connection between the short story as a form and orality. This is something that is very obvious, particularly in American fiction, in, in the American short story. And so I think the fact that she puts this story at the end, uh, I think this is a, a statement also about the connection uh, between storytelling and the folktale, and she has insisted on this, I think, quite a lot. Okay, thank you, Cathy. There's a, another question. Um, um, considering your emphasis on sight and on the visual, would you describe Mashiro's writing in Intruders as cinematic? And a question which is, well, just from the same viewer, uh, more generally, any thought about possible intermedial influences, uh, for example, the use of uh, the zombie figures, for example? Yes, because she's she's using things that she picks up from various types of media. Uh, and this, I think, is, if I remember correctly, is something she talked about uh, in our conversation, because... Um, she once again she's talking about south africa not as a place that is isolated from the world but that is a place like all countries in the world today that is connected to everything so you have references to b movies to c movies you have references to um to music Although I admit I was thinking Miriam Makiba, but no, that's M Miriam Makiba appears in The Yearning. But there are references to sending text messages, uh, to songs, to movies. So there, there is this sense that precisely we're not in a world of folklore of the past. We're, we're in a South Africa that is connected in many different ways to uh, to the outside world plus the fact that as i said she's using a certain number of things like spaceships that are really almost cliches but also the zombies uh, the werewolves a number of elements that are basically cliches of uh of comic strips and uh and films okay thank you thank you so much Katie, uh for this uh wonderful uh, uh, paper and thank you everyone for uh, the great questions that you, uh, that you asked. Uh, well, now, as I said um, at the beginning, the next speaker is Richard Sama, who for technical reasons, uh, as I said before, can't be with us today. Uh, he nevertheless uh, recorded his paper entitled Mohale Mashiro's The Yearning, Vindicating African Storytelling in Post-Transitional South Africa. However, before we listen to uh, Richard, I suggest I briefly explain uh, what the yearning is about by giving you some details uh, concerning the diegesis. I'm going to share a PowerPoint document with you, and I do hope that um, this uh, will be useful as an anticipation uh, to, Richard's, uh, to Richard, uh, Richard's paper. Uh, so I'm waiting maybe for the, the, the document uh, to appear. Um, on the screen. Yes, it's coming. So the, 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 the yearning uh, was published in uh, 2016. And it's a novel that is uh, composed of five parts, uh, the first and the last, uh, the first and the last ones uh, being very short. So the five parts are the yearning, the name, the sun, the Holy Spirit, and Amen. Um, it's a first person narrative. Uh, the protagonist is uh, Marubini, a middle-class uh, young woman 
who works at the uh, De Villiers uh, wine farm, particularly uh, in the marketing department. Uh, before she decided to resign from her former uh, uh, job in advertising, uh, because she had come to hate that job, uh, she explains, um, most of my colleagues uh, thought that taking a two-hour township tour that ended at a tourist-friendly drinking spot was a good way to get to know the target market, she explains. She adds that, uh, it's another quote that you have on, on the document, uh, they just couldn't get why I would object to the fact that black people were portrayed dancing. Why would they be dancing when the advert was for tea? There are traces of uh, racism in that company that she can't uh, put up with, uh, hence her decision to leave uh, that very company. Uh, her story is intrinsically linked to the greater story of racism uh, in the country. Marubini's boyfriend uh, is a restaurant owner and a Frenchman, uh, while Unati is her best friend. So maybe there's a, a family tree uh, at some point, maybe. Yes, uh, it's on the screen right now to for you to identify uh, the relationships between the different characters. Uh, storytelling, which appears in uh, Richard Saman's uh, title, is at, is at the very heart uh, of this novel. And it's very important for Mohale Mashiros uh, herself, who in an interview said, I quote, that's the next slide, uh, we bury our stories and wonder why we are so much in pain. So these ideas of uh, burial and uh, memory are central in this novel and just in passing, I will dwell on this next week when I give uh, my paper. Also uh, worthy of interest at the beginning of the novel is the emphasis that is laid on the community of women, the grandmother, the mother, Unati, but also the protagonist herself. Uh, there's also an emphasis on circularity. The novel starts with a birth and ends with a birth, for example. One element that could be interesting for uh, the reader, but also for you in general, uh, is also the lack of linearity uh, in the novel itself and the use of the tree stream of consciousness technique. Now, let's listen to uh, Richard. Um, and again, it would be great if you could comment this time on what you hear rather than ask uh, questions, as Richard is not among us today. Please note that you will listen to a shortened uh, version of his paper, it was supposed to contain three parts, but because we don't have enough time, uh, we'll listen to two of them only. We're very sorry about that. Now, let Lisa introduce Richard Sama. Richard Sama taught at the University of Lorraine from 1998 to 2009, first as an assistant professor until 2001, and then as a professor. Since 2009, he has been an emeritus professor. Formerly, he worked in primary and secondary education, and he taught French and English in Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and Côte d'Ivoire for 16 years. He wrote a doctorate thesis on two South African writers' novels, Alex Laguma and Eskia Mparlele, which he defended at the University of Rouen in June 1986. His field of study focuses on South African literature and history, post-colonial studies, and literary theory. He carried out several research miss missions in South Africa in 1995, 1997, 1999, and 2002, which were funded by the French Institute of South Africa, IFAS, in Johannesburg. In the course of these missions, he had the opportunity to meet and interview many South African authors and cultural actors. He works, his works focus on several South African writers, such as J.M. Kutsi, Alex Laguma, Eska Mpalele, and Ivan Vladislavic, and on various themes, city, landscape, colonial space, and interdisciplinary. His works and many of his interviews were published in journals and collective works in France, as well as in Germany, South Africa, the United States, States Japan, and Switzerland. In an article on both transitional South African literature in English, Ronit Frankel and Craig McKenzie contend that the fiction written during that period is characterized by, I quote, a proliferation of genres, concerns and styles, and includes such features as politically incorrect humor, 
incisive satire, and the mixing of genres with zest and, hum and freedom." End of quote. South African sociologist Sarah Nuttall further identifies the cultural production of the period as, quote, blendings, interconnections, hybridities, and ambiguities, end of quote. Mohale Mashigo's The Yearning displays some of these features, but is also a narrative that offers a personal take on today's South Africa. This is a period which, according to Sir Natal, is no longer dominated by the segregated theory which, under apartheid, underpinned an opposition, opposition logic of master dualisms, such as perpetrators and victims, oppression and resistance, black and white. As a result, it is a, piece, it is a period fraught with uncertainties and contradictions, where many are at a loss to find their own bearings. In this context, I contend that the yearning hinges around two interrelated themes, a quest for truth and a process of self-empowerment. The question is how the narrative structure serves a longing for meaning in personal identity, and how its national and even transnational imaginary space dovetails with the problematic question of cultural identity in a multicultural country. My paper will be divided into three parts. First, the yearning as a search for truth and identity. Second, the yearning as a tale of empowerment. And third, the yearning's contribution to cultural syncretism. In her introductory chapter, Mohale Mashigo underlines the importance of storytelling and asserts that, quote, stories matter, and so, so do the, vo the voices of storytellers, especially stories by young South African writers. But above all, she strongly vindicates her belonging to the field of literature. The yearning is my, soul, my small contribution towards putting us in literature, because we do belong. A vindication which she reiterates two years later in her, in her introduction to a collection of short stories, Intruders, when she asserts that what I want for Africans living in Africa is to imagine a future in their storytelling that deals with issues that are unique to us. In both texts, Mohale Mashigo clearly puts forward the issues she wants to engage with. In post-transitional South Africa, victims and oppressors share the same living space. It is a new configuration that Achille Mbembe describes as one of illicit cohabitation between oppressors and oppressed, with the result that post-colonial identities are coheval rather than incommensurate. Paul Gilroy used the notion of conviviality to refer to the process of cohabitation and interaction that has made multiculture an ordinary feature of social life. Mohale Mashigo describes our situation in terms which more or less echo both Mbembe's and Gilroy's ideas when she asserts that she never suffered from a lack of representation. But at the same time, she said that she was living in a country where my culture, language and presence were considered a nuisance. The yearning maps out the concrete and singular conditions conducive to the heroine's discovery of the truth and of the nature of her desire or yearning. As regards the concept of desire, Gilles Deleuze claims that it is not a hankering for something that is wanting, but an energy, a power to persist and invent one's own style so as to go as far as one can to eschew being assigned to a single identity. A notion that the heroine seems to endorse at the beginning of the yearning, quote, a part of who I used to be has vanished and I'm now faced with the possibilities of who I could be, end of quote. The yearning is a tale that skillfully combines different cultural motifs and social backgrounds. Its structure is composed of two temporal levels, 
One constitutes a framing narrative located in the present onto which is grafted an embedded narrative located in the past. While the framing narrative is written in the present tense and follows a chronological order with a few analytic sections in which the heroine remembers episodes of her past, the embedded narrative, on the other hand, is written in the past tense and does not follow a a chronological line. It is basically an an analytic text that moves back and forth in time in order to piece together episodes of the heroine's past in the manner of a jigsaw puzzle. It is up to the reader to replace the events in the appropriate order. Each narrative level is divided into fragments that regularly alternate as they shift from one temporal level to another. Each transition from the present to the past is carefully engineered with words or themes that help the reader tie together the narrative threads into an elaborate pattern. Moreover, in order to establish a more visible distinction between the two levels, the author uses different fonts. The centripetal force that holds the whole structure together is the overwhelming presence of the heroine's voice and consciousness on both temporal levels in the form of an intra-homodiegetic narrator. It allows the reader to be closely in touch with all the external factors that affect her and with her responses to them. A narrative also encompasses a plurality of other voices and stories that give the novel its dialogical dimension. To sum up the story, Marubini is a modern, dynamic, hardworking and willful middle-class young woman who has a job in the marketing department of a Stellan Bosch wine farm after quitting an advertising agency in reaction to white residual racial attitudes. She lives in Cape Town and shares her life with her French lover, Pierre, a restaurant owner, and her friend, Unati. The plot is triggered with an enigmatic statement uttered by her maternal grandmother, Nicono, about her name, and by an allusion to lies. I quote, Nicono says she regrets giving me my name. Mama, I don't think my name is the problem. The real problem is all the lies, end of quote. Soon after, she suffers from mysterious bodily ailments and mental confusion that baffle her understanding. She has seizures, hallucinations, nightmares. She feels nauseous and fears that her flat is haunted. The iteration and increasing severity of this phenomena occasionally bring about, bring about loss of consciousness and hospitalization. As a result, she's determined to find out the causes of these incapacitating disorders, a quest for truth commands the drift of a story. The novel displays a fully wide range of generic affiliations. It can be read, first of all, as a life story relating Marubini's life from the day of her birth to the present. Second, it is at the same time a Bildung story that retraces the different episodes of her education into adulthood. Third, it is a psychological thriller that invites a rational inquiry into the heroine's mysterious somatic and psychological disorders. Four, it is a narrative that carries us beyond the realm of reality with its elements of fantasy and magical realism. The sudden intrusion of unnatural phenomena, such as oral and visual hallucinations, Shadowy presences, tactile sensations on our body, often accompanied by physiological reactions, such as nausea, dizziness, seizures, bouts of crying and screaming, create a kind of unheimlichkeit or uncanniness. The uncertainty which the character experiences is also the uncertainty the reader may possibly have to make sense of them. Uncertainty 
or hesitation is precisely the key criterion which Zvetan Todorov uses to define fantasy. I quote, fantasy is the uncertainty which a person whose cognitive mental setup entirely relies on natural laws experiences when he is confronted with an event that seems unnatural, end of quote. The eeriness that that kind of fantasy entails <clears throat> relates essentially to the framing narrative, that is, to the heroine's present. The other unnatural phenomena which are reported in what I have called the embedded narrative do not exactly come under fantasy, but under another generic category, that of magical realism. In his typology of magical realism, William Spindler makes out two kinds of magical realism. One is anthropological realism, which gives popular culture and magical beliefs the same degree of importance as Western science and rationality. The other is ontological magic realism, in which the supernatural is presented in a matter-of-fact way, as if it did not contradict reason, and no explanations are offered for the unreal events in the text. The yearning displays a combination of both magical realisms, and it is the implicit acceptance of this form of magical realism which validates the truth value of such statements as my mother died seven times before she gave birth to me, or my father was a snake, a water snake. And more significantly, the ancestors communicated their wishes through my body. In other words, the notion of magical realism used here is simply the generic expression of beliefs and practices whose validity is upheld by a specific cultural context. The articulation between fantasy and magical realism allows the introduction of cultural difference and foregrounds the relationship between the past and the present. Towards the end of the novel, one of the heroine's grandmothers muses about her granddaughter's problems. Quote, who is to say whether it is trauma or the calling? End quote. Such a question begs two possible answers. One falls within the province of the somatic and psychological, the trauma, and the other falls within the province of the religious or the magic, the calling. As a reminder, Marubini's father left his family to follow the calling, just as his aunt got the calling who would change her life. In other words, both went through rites of initiation to become some sangomas or traditional healers. The end of the novel, of course, brings an answer to both questions. Some of Marubini's ailments can be first ascribed to the trauma she suffered as a child after being been being sexually molested by an adult, but also to the fact that, as her mother belatedly discovers, she is pregnant. The other symptoms are directly related to her connection with African spirituality and history, which, in her case, is not simply a religious calling, but a yearning, that is, a desire that envelops both a religious and a secular commitment. The multi-layered generic inscriptions in the novel reflect the epistemological uncertainty that is in keeping with the main character's restless quest for empowerment. The Yearning is a life story of empowerment which relates how, through a series of happy or harrowing experiences, a girl grows up into a young woman who finally comes into her role as a lover, mother, and sangoma. There are two ways of interpreting the heroine's evolution until she discovers the truth behind a predicament. First, a narration can be envisioned as a discursive exercise akin to a, psychoanalytic, a psychoanalytical procedure whereby the patient is gradually led to discover the source of her psychological disorders by inducing her to describe the symptoms that perturb her. 
It is most often a protracted and episodic affair that requires the presence of an analyst. The fragmented structure of the novel and the role played by some of the protagonists as privileged interlocutors may warrant such a reading. The second way of reading the story of Marub in his life is to focus on the nature of our sensations, or more precisely, on how she describes the external factors which affect her body and her sensibility, and how she reacts to them. In this respect, the body plays an essential part in several ways. First, it is the seat of somatic and and psychological affections. Second, her body is instrumental in the way she accedes to agency and self-fulfillment. Third, the body as a cultural marker is inserted in a web of practices pertaining to African beliefs and spirituality. The eponymous introductory chapter ends with a series of anaphoras in which the word yearning is the subject of verbs that are all related to bodily affections. The yearning haunts him, the yearning confuses her, the yearning hurts me, the yearning devours us. These alterations, which endow a single word with agency, invite the reader to turn to the dictionary. It only tells us that to yearn is to be filled with longing, compassion, or tenderness for something or towards a person. If we accept Ludwig Wittgenstein's assertion that the signification of a word lies in its usage in the language, the introductory chapter boils down to an invitation to pay particular heed to the context of its occurrences. There is one thing which I would like to focus on. One night, Marubini finds herself alone in her boss's office. She is overwhelmed by a feeling that it is not fear, but, I quote, a yearning, a longing to be outside, end of quote. Then she hears a voice that tells her to walk towards the lake. And suddenly she realizes that she's running without her feet touching the soil and that her body's voice guides her. She then finds herself naked with half of her body immersed in water. The water is cool, but she heats it up with a longing to the extent that steam rises from the water and hangs like a curtain shielding her. As she further sinks into the water, she's without doubt fear or confusion, and she notes that the body voice speaks and tells her to trust herself with the truth. The whole scene obviously posits a connection between yearning, body, and truth, suggesting that her yearning is a quest for truth in which the body plays a major role. Later in the novel, her father's aunt, whom she calls Grandmother Magugo, Grandmother in Isizulu, confirms that this connection between yearning, this connection between yearning and truth. Marubini's yearning is a yearning for the truth that we took away from her. The accumulation of bodily, bodily disorders, which undermine both her sanity and sense of identity, eventually goad her into finding out what is wrong with her. I really have no idea what's going on, but something is, and I can't live without finding out what. As a result, she accepts to submit herself to a ritual during which certain rites are performed on her body so that she might retrieve episodes of her past. I quote, there is smoke filling the room. I can't see it, but I can feel it. It slips into my nostrils and from there into my entire body. End of quote. This brings me to the second way in which the body is instrumental in our discovery of the truth and her accession to empowerment. In order to deal with this point, I need to refer briefly to a few philosophical concepts, such as affections and affects as defined by Spinoza. Briefly speaking, Affections are modifications of our body brought about by the encounter with external bodies or objects. Affects, on the other hand, are affections that modify our power of existing 
and of acting. Spinova makes, uh, makes out two, diff- two types of affects. Affects of joy that include pleasure, love, happiness, and leisure. Affects of sadness that include suffering, pain, hatred. While affects of joy increase our power of acting, affects of sadness diminish it. The encounter with external bodies or objects, depending on how they combine with our body, can thus either make it stronger or weaken it. Weaken it. If we choose to, cons- to consider Marubini's evolution in this light, we realize that she keeps wavering between contrasting moods depending on the, de- on the degree with which our affections impinge on our understanding. The trauma she underwent in her childhood and the noxious affections that ensued were translated into a protracted diminution of her power of acting. Conversely, whenever her experiences or perceptions generate more congenial affections, she feels at one with her body and her power of acting is increased. This is the case, for instance, when she finds herself immersed in the lake, as we have seen above, or when she remembers all the happy moments she shared with her grandfather, Antate Moholo, or with her grandmother, Ankono, during her initiation into womanhood. We could add to this list lovemaking, as was the case with her first boyfriend. I quote, the more I had sex, the more I enjoyed it. We even learn new things together. I was, never, I was never scared to learn. I would insist that we do new things together, sometimes to Tabo's dismay. End of quote. The most significant effects of joy that increase her power of acting are related to the moments when she finally discovers the true causes of her ailments and of her father's absence. But the body does not simply facilitate the heroine's empowerment. It is also a signifier that occupies a prominent part in African spirituality, insofar as it is associated with various rites of initiation or purification. In order to deal her, to heal her daughter, Marubini's father, in keeping with the belief that, I quote, every healer knows that memories are located in the body, end quote, and that it is the blood that keeps them in the body, her father makes a few incisions on her wrist and her neck to collect a little of her blood so that the darkness it contains might be drained from her body and carried away. His mission, as he explained, is to carry the burden of the pain she has suffered to a faraway place where, quote, we, Abantu, were once kings, queens, and wise scholars of the stars and moons, end quote. This is a place of origins where the strongest ancestors live, and they alone can deliver him of his burden. In other words, with the father's odyssey, Mohale Mashigo gestures towards the myth of an age-old tradition, which Marubini herself embodies, given the meaning of her name, ancient civilization, and the descriptions her grandmother gives of her when she was born. You look like a queen from an ancient civilization, so regal and certain. You look so much like a tiny queen from a long time ago. Marubini occupies a legitimate place in this age-old tradition as she carries on the legacy of her father. Like him, she wears a bangle of red and white beads, white and red being also the colors of the snake into which her father changes in the last vision she has of him. Incidentally, the snake in some African societies, as John Beatty notes in his book, African Religion and Philosophy, is the form that the spirits take to visit the living. Moreover, within the field of black South African, liter- South African literary culture, the allusion to a water snake recalls the scene depicted by Thomas Mofolo in his novel Shaka, when Shaka, bathing naked in a pool, encounters the king of the deep pool, that is, a huge water snake, which embraces him and predicts his future. I quote, 
the small column of thick mist arose from the deep pool. It formed an elongated cloud which came and covered him so that he could see nothing. And then out of the reeds over there, something boomed with a heavy, stentorious voice. Kalamash wing, Kalamash wing, it is seen only by the favored ones. Kalamash wing, Kalamash wing is seen by those who will rule over nations. End of quote. The idea of timelessness that envelops Marubili may apparently contradict her willingness to enjoy the present to the utmost, as she does, for instance, after making love with her lover. I quote, I close my eyes drenched in now, end of quote. Or her father's advice, always choose today. But such a stance does not preclude the idea of eternity as defined by Wittgenstein, quote, if one conceives of, it, conceives of eternity not as an infinite temporal duration, but as timelessness, so he lives eternally who lives in the present. End of quote. The layering of different cultural and literary traditions that the yearning encapsulates is an exercise which has characterized the development of black South African literature throughout its history. Conclusion. The yearning is a quest for identity, vindicating an African heritage through a process of transculturation, whereby African law, and particularly African spirituality, is reprocessed through Western narrative procedures that inscribe African culture in literature on a national and global scene. The yearning is a tale that wavers between rationality and fantasy a cognitive wavering that illustrates the cultural syncretism whereby two main cultural realms, cultural realms, European and African, come to meet on unequal terms. The form of storytelling that the yearning vindicates is, as the author claims in her introduction to intruders, valid, because it is essential in a country that has for many years let stories get buried and unmarked graves. This statement comes as an echo of a similar statement which Eskar Lele made a few decades earlier to vindicate traditional storytelling, which provided him with, quote, a good training ground from which to launch an odyssey of the imagination and inform the morality associated with African humanism. A simple faith free of the tyranny of theology and intellectual argument, end of quote. The yearning perpetuates this ongoing pursuit of both spiritual and artistic freedom. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, unfortunately, he's not with us. Um, um today uh, I, I don't know if there are comments on uh, coming from youtube uh, maybe i have a question for uh, Cathy. um Cathy, I, I can't see you but i'd, I'd love to, to to see you um maybe to to link uh, your presentation and uh, richard's uh, presentation uh, you mentioned hybridity in your paper uh, Richard refers to cultural syncretism or transculturalism. Uh, do you have the impression that this um, hybridity is Mohale uh, Mashiro is a Mohale Mashiro staple? And uh, I read in an interview uh, recently that as a member of what she calls the integration generation, she and other members of her generation, I quote, unconsciously code switch both linguistically and culturally. Uh, maybe, maybe a question concerning this concept of code switching and, and particularly code, switch, code switching culturally in her work. Would you uh, say something about this? Or yes, I think there's there's a lot of code switching, and I think she's f trying to find original ways uh, to do this. Uh, and in this novel, having uh, both the South African present in which 
Uh, the character is working for a winery. So the present uh, seems, in a sense, um, almost not really anchored in South Africa. It could almost be anywhere. Mm. And on the other hand, uh, the, the complexities of the ways in which people are reaching into the past. And I think that she also shows very diverse characters. Uh, for instance, the mother who is going to uh, uh, open a nursery uh, and therefore become independent. Um, the aunt, Thoko, who uh, has the calling and is a Sangoma, as her father was. Uh, so you have also a kind of hybridity of roles. Uh, the grandfather who really spends a lot of time with his granddaughter. Uh, so I think there's, there's definitely uh, a sense once again, as there is in the short stories of uh, South Africa in the world, something that maybe makes it a little bit more difficult precisely for the character to get back in touch with her past. And you talked about code switching. Uh, of course, code switching is a, a term that is used in talking about language. Mm. The, the mixing of languages is fascinating. Um, and well, uh, Mohari Mashigo talked about that in her first uh, presentation in Nalsi because I asked her a question about okay. languages. And she said, uh, like most writers, she said, I always give you some way of understanding what the Zulu or the Sosotho is really saying uh, so that you're not left there wondering, you know, the characters are talking among themselves and I can't understand what they're saying. But I thought that the use of the African languages was very interesting because uh, the characters quite obviously tend to use them in situations of intimacy uh, among themselves. So, and there's a very interesting moment when I think uh, it is her mother, uh, Maru's mother, who talks about the Sangoma and uses the word witchcraft. And I thought that that was interesting because she uses the English word. And then, of course, it raised the question in my mind, what language are these people speaking? <laughs> because the novel is written in English. But the fact that she that she uses this English term, which gives a kind of derogatory connotation, whereas the word Sangoma is specifically African. So there's definitely this sense of two worlds uh, that are trying to somehow live together. Mm -hmm. OK, there's a, a YouTube um, comment also. Um, uh, Richard Samin emphasized the dialogical dimension of the yearning. Uh, do you also identify, Cathy, uh, uh, sorry, you're very uh, solicited today, <laughs> identify a dialogical dimension in the intruders? Well, yes, because the, there's all of the, the interaction between the characters. Mm. Um, that uh, Richard didn't talk necessarily very much about in his paper, but you can't talk about everything. But that, that's what I find interesting. You have the, you have the mother, the father, you have uh, Makusha, who is the mother, the father, Baba. Uh, you have Maru, you have her brother, Simpuwe. Uh, you have the grandmother, the aunt, you have all of these people who do not necessarily represent the same ideas or the same positions. And so there's also Maru's, in a sense, growing up or coming to terms with herself, is going to bring all of these people back into conversation with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I found, for instance, the fact that her mother has a nursery, the mother seems to be quite modern. Uh, Thoko, the, the aunt, represents a more traditional position in, uh, in being a Sangoma. Uh, so 
a, a lot of the interest of the story, I think, comes from the interactions between these different characters. Plus, you have the boyfriend who is French, Franco-Moroccan. Uh, so uh, the dialogical aspect is important because it's really what what makes the story advance. As in any novel, if you if you can't deal with dialogue, then you can't write a novel. And mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. novel is very good from that point of view. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Cathy. Well, thank you um, to the organizers. Uh, thank you to our speakers, uh, uh, Cathy and Richard. Of course, he wasn't here today, but thank you very much. Uh, but above all, uh, maybe thank you to the audience. I uh, hope you did make the most of this session. And we also do hope uh, that you will be among us next week, uh, same, same, same place, same time. And do not hesitate, of course, to tell people around you to come and join us. Meanwhile, take good care of yourselves. Goodbye.